Well, folks, we may be joined by others, but as a courtesy of people who are already here, we will begin. And as we always do, uh, we'll start out uh, by introducing ourselves so our speakers will we'll know with whom they're conversing. Sherry? Who are you? No, I, I'm the last. I go last. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm Sherry Gray in the Global Programs. I'm Dan Gifford from the Law School. Maury Kleiner from the Humphrey School. I'm Michelle Chaika. I'm from the Public Nonprofit Leadership Center. I'm uh, Victor Chen from the Carlson School. Um, I'm Queen Gajun from the Humphrey School. I'm Benjamin Baller from the Colleges of Sciences and Engineering. Uh, Isaac Fox, retired. <laughs> Paul Ballard from the Carlson School Law School. I'm Joanne Magnuson. I'm the curator of the Jewish Christian Library out at uh, Maranatha High School. And I've been involved in uh, Israel activities for years. <laughs> It's great. It's great. Joel Fogel is our other speaker today, in addition to Paul. Um, I think most people here know our two speakers, either personally or professional. Uh, Joel Wolfogel is the Frederick R. Capital Chair in Applied Economics and Strategic Management and Entrepreneurship Department at the Carlson School. He's done a lot of extremely interesting work, and I was curious to see from this piece how it's summarized. It says that industrial organization, law and economics, empirical studies of price advertising, media markets, operation of differentiated product markets, and issues related to digital products, including piracy, pricing, and revenue sharing. <laughs> Some of you may remember that he gave a talk in this seminar a couple of years ago uh, on the issue of whether or not world music trade had displaced local culture. Uh, tends to pick really interesting questions like that, including the one uh, today. Our other speaker has uh, been here many times, uh, many of you know, Paul Harley. Uh, Paul is uh, at also in the Strategic Management Entrepreneurship uh, Department at the B School, the Carlson School. He is, in addition to that, the John and Bruce Moody Chair in Law and Business at the University of Minnesota law school. Paul has talked on a number of issues in this seminar series. His current research is on migrants, remittances, uh, and venture investment in developing countries, credit rating agencies, and sovereign risk. He's talked about both of those subjects here. Political business cycles in emerging democracies, and performance trends in technology industries and firms. I don't know exactly how the two of them got together on this paper, but, but I think they will explain this. The one thing that I do know that they have in common with each other, that they don't have in common with all but a handful of other faculty members at the University of Minnesota, is they both grew up in Minneapolis. Yes. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll let them explain where this, subject, where this came from. I read this paper, it is really, really interesting. Discriminatory product differentiation. I left that off the advertising because yeah, I thought that kind of yeah. stuff would drive people away. <laughs> the case of Israel's omission from airline route maps. So. Well, so first of all, thank you very much. And then the second thing, the two-word answer to how this happened is Quentin Tarantino. Exactly. <laughs> we, were, we went to see a Quentin Tarantino movie together, and then we got to chatting afterwards about some obsessive late-night uh, uh, online route map stalking I've been doing, and, and, and then whatever happened, happened. Now, anytime I come to Humphrey, and I don't get here often enough, I have to tell the story of my, uh, my kind of deep connection to Humphrey. When I was in eighth grade, as you said, I grew up here, uh, one of my closest friends was a kid named Chris Brandle whose father was John Brandle, who anybody been around here a long time knows, uh, knows well. By that time, he had been here for quite some time. I guess he directed it before it was a school, an institute, and he was a state representative and a, and a state uh, senator. And he also was the first economist I ever met. And I think partly because of that, I went off to college and wanted to study economics and continued doing it you know, ever since. So I have this sort of deep connection to Humphrey uh, that, that, that makes me smile. All right, so uh, let's, let's talk. And I, I don't know, is the custom here just to ask questions as we go? As, as you choose. You I'm comfortable choose. with that. You, you know, if it gets really, if something needs to be deferred, but I, I'm, I'd rather have you ask questions as we go. Okay, and I'm, and I'm going to call Paul in for any hard questions. All right. <laughs> so the, the motivating idea here, you know, if you want to sort of put it in lofty terms first and then come to the context second, is to say, well, suppose a firm wants to discriminate against some group of customers. Now, one option for that firm is to just literally treat different customers differently. 
you know, as, as Denny's did, I guess I can say they did because they, they, they lost the suit. Uh, when, you know, when there are too many African-American customers in the restaurant, they had a policy they called blackouts that they would, they would slow down service. And uh, in any event, uh, they were called out for this. There's a big settlement, millions and millions of dollars. This approach is unsubtle. It's illegal. Uh, it's also, you know, odious. Uh, now, there's another option. Okay? Another option is to differentiate the product. Right? So tailor a product to suit the tastes of some customers, but not others. Now, of course, it's always the case that particular targeting of differentiated products you know, uh, is going to help some consumers and, and hurt others. Now, that's generally not a bad thing. That's generally considered a benign feature of, of a market. It provides variety that's appealing to people. Um, but, of course, it can be used to make products unappealing to particular groups. I mean, here's a caricature of an example. I was looking online for this. I think this is like the Confederate belt buckle store. I can't imagine it's that appealing to, to everyone, although I can imagine it's appealing to some. All right, so uh, we're, we're led to this, this idea we're going to pursue here called discriminatory product differentiation. That is differentiating the product in a, in a manner that is, can, in effect, serve to discriminate against certain kinds of consumers. Now, there are, there are two different, I think, motivations that one could think about for this. And I want to say up front, uh, as a human being, I think we would, human beings, we would argue both are pernicious. Although, as an economist, and I won't call Paul, I won't, I won't tar you with that, with that label. As an economist, one could make a distinction between the two. But we're, we're also both human. So anyways, the first one is just enhancing profitability by appealing to consumer tastes. So, for example, if you have customers who are discriminatory or racist or whatever, you might appeal to them simply for the goal of making money. Okay, which again, it, this could be a pernicious thing if you're if you're doing things that are, that, you know. But it can. So the first motivation could just be about appealing to the tastes of your customers. There's a second kind of motivation though, which involves indulging the owner's taste for discrimination, right? And so this would be suppose you have discriminatory customers. This might be going beyond what's needed simply to accommodate your discriminatory customers. Now, this was talked about you know, as early as Becker's 1957 dissertation. He talks about dis discrimination in various contexts. And his argument there is you, know, you can, in some instances, expect competition to, to, to cause discrimination to go away, but not so much if firms have market power. If firms have market power, then they can decide to dissipate some of their profits by engaging in discrimination against customers or against certain kinds of employees or, or, or whatever. So we're going to try to think about these two different motivations and whether we can attribute some of what we see to either or both of these stories. But again, I think it's, it's fair to say as humans, we're, we're on the, on the, of the view that both are pernicious. Now the context here, and maybe this becomes clearer when we get to the context itself, it's, it's international airlines, Israel, and Jews. And so the first question is, how do online route maps treat Israel? And as we'll show you shortly, uh, there, there are sort of interesting distinctions among how different airlines treat Israel, including some outright blatant omission of Israel on the maps. And is this, is this about appealing to anti-Israeli customers? Is it about indulging the preferences of the owners of these airlines? Now there's a second kind of parallel question here. You might think about the first question as being in some sense about Zionism or anti-Zionism. There's a second question that we, we're going to look at about offering publicly announced kosher meals. You know, and we're going to treat that as a window into uh, anti-Semitism as distinct from uh, what one might arguably distinguish as anti-Zionism. Okay, so those are the two kind of specific, narrow questions without the loftier motivation. Now, even before we get to airlines, you know, we, we want to note that, that omitting Israel is not an uncontroversial decision. Even, one, even if one were to take the view that it's not odious or not pernicious, it's still a very questionable business decision in the sense that it can invite controversy and not a good kind of controversy. 2015, one of the world's biggest publishers, HarperCollins, published an atlas for the Middle East that omitted Israel in the following way. This is a reproduction of the map. Um, and they called it an adaptation to local preferences. Some, <laughs> Brit some British blogger, uh, with I think uh, a blog called The Tablet, yeah, a Catholic, Catholic blog, I think, uh, noticed it, publicized it. It got picked up in many, many major newspapers. The publisher apologized, was sort of scandalized, had to destroy all the copies of this Alex. <laughs> so the point is, there's a sense in which this is playing with fire, whatever your moral views about this uh, might be. OK, but getting to the specific context of these maps, we're going to develop a taxonomy of maps to put them in four categories. And the pictures themselves are pretty interesting and fun, but let's just start with the taxonomy. So one kind of scheme uh, names every country of the world, including Israel. 
So that is the country names are present, including the name of Israel. We're going to call that an embracing or an embracer map. A second kind of map names every country in the world except, oops, not Israel. Okay, we're going to call that a denier. There is another species of map, airline online, online route map, that names every country of the world except for Israel, oh, and North Korea, or, and uh, Taiwan. So, yeah, Taiwan, North Korea, Israel, or in another case, there are a few others. A few extras omitted. Yeah. I had a question. So, for design projects, I don't know much about the route maps and everything, but when they omit Israel and everything, what do they say in terms of like the West Bank and Gaza? So and I'll, I'll show you. Also? Yeah, okay. I'll show you. I'll show you. And, I, and then there's a last kind of well, yeah, sorry. There's a, a last kind of map uh, that, and actually, it's not uncommon for maps not to name any countries, just to name city destinations that they fly to. And so it, in some sense, avoids the problem of having to decide whether to put country names on the map. And so it's a kind of I don't know if to, what to call it diplomatic or cowardly or, or expedient. I don't know what, but whatever. It avoids the avoiders. Now, um, this is the standard Google map. And it actually, Google is going to play a role in many of these maps because many, many online route maps are, are, are derived based on Google maps. In fact, directly rely on Google. So here's the standard Google map. And I guess the, can you see it well? I mean, basically, the thing to, to note that I want to note, Israel's on there, as is every country that Israel puts, or sorry, that Google puts on the default map. Um, and Google's logo is on it as well. Okay, so it's just a standard Google map. So this is how Google standardly treats every country. So they don't name Palestine. Right. Yeah. So they're doing it by the UN definition then. Palestine. Well, yeah. That's um, interesting. I mean, it's, so, it's interesting, depending on what project you're doing. So I have this project, totally unrelated, on global distribution of Netflix. And followers of world geography are always surprised when I say, well, Google, I mean, sorry, Netflix has distribution into 244 countries. People say, well, wait a minute, there aren't 244 <laughs> countries. So what's going on? And anyway, so Palestine's one, um, but, but that's a different problem. But I, yeah, so I don't even know. Do we even know what Google claims the default Google map? I think we should just make a note of that, whether they use the UN or what. But what is the, the default, the basis for the default list? I'm not sure. The basis for default list on Google. Because it's probably a bigger economic impact as to how you label Taiwan and China. Oh. Yeah. Well, so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that. All right, this is the standard map. But now let's, let's look at a series of, uh, I think, representative examples of airline route maps. So here's the Air Canada map. Uh, Air, Air Canada, like many, in fact, most of the major airlines of the world are what we would call embracers. They use a Google-based map that names every country of the world, regardless of whether they fly to that country. The Google logo appears on the map. Uh, and, and it is, uh, yeah, it's a Google-based a Google -based map. I mean, it's interactive, too, so if you, know, you can drill down on it. It is using whatever the Google tools that live underneath now, it. Now, are there other uh, maps, or other maps besides Google that are used? Uh, there, there, do, there are some <coughs> maps that are not Google maps, and I don't even know if we have clarity about whether they're branded or whether somebody, we should look into that. I mean, there are some non-Google maps for sure. I don't know if there's a branded provider. There are not many. And the other thing is, we're talking about, it's important, as Joel's mentioned, these are the online route maps. So they're not necessarily the map maker who would be in your, your in-flight magazine in the back seat. But what about if, if you had, if you're looking at a screen and you're, you're plotting or, or looking at the countries where you're flying to, you mean, uh, would it be a Google map or would it be... It's not a Google map. That's somebody else. The one, the one that's in the seat in front screen of you. that yeah, you're, no, you're seeing where you're flying to and, and so on. I don't know who the provider is, but it's not Google. That's him. And those maps uh, aren't like Google Maps in the sense that they don't have country names by default on them. So I don't know. But there's an interesting separate question of who provides that and how it works. I mean, there have we've occasionally come in, uh, bumped into blog posts here and there where somebody will, uh, will will take a picture of the map in front of them because there's something about it that they find objectionable. Um, we had a, there's an article in the Haaretz magazine in, or newspaper in Israel about Etihad from 2014 that noted that Etihad was one of the deniers. And Etihad's response is, oh no, in our in-flight magazines, we don't have any countries. But as you'll see, they are a denier on their online route map, or a plausible denial of that, you'll see. OK, so an example of the second kind of map, an avoider map, here's Royal Jordanian. And they're an interesting airline in a lot of ways. I mean, for one thing, uh, among Middle East non-Israeli carriers, they do fly to Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv's on them. Right, so, but they're an example of an avoider. They, they, the red dots are cities uh, where they fly. Tel Aviv's one of them. 
Uh, LL, interestingly, is also an avoider. The way the LL map... <laughs> yeah, that's really <laughs> tricky. Well, let's, I mean, let's, let's be fair here. I mean, so with the LL map, you know, you choose a one of a series of maps. So this is the map that shows, I guess, Africa. Um, you know, if you choose the Europe map, it looks different. But if you choose the Africa map, you'll see the Middle East, and you'll see their destinations, Cairo and uh, Johannesburg. Yes? Uh, so, in a sense, maybe this is like devil's advocate, but in a sense, well, doesn't it make sense for a flight map to just have where that airline goes? Because, I mean, maybe if you're looking for specific places, you can be like, oh, this on the map shows where they fly, but if it had everything, you want to go somewhere, they don't fly there, I don't know, it could cause something. Yeah, I mean, I think the fly. avoider map is a pretty natural thing. Quite a lot yeah. of airlines do this. So, um, we'll show you something interesting about the avoiders mm -hmm. in a little bit, but nevertheless, it, it, it does make a lot of sense. After all, why do I need to see a whole bunch of cities I'm not going to? Yeah. Right. This is not a Google-based map, so it, it does not by its nature, when you zoom down on it, it does not by its nature show the things Google-based maps show. I mean, in some sense, a, a version of the question is, let's say, if you start with the Google-based map, as many carriers do, why then do something to adjust it? There are many sensible adjustments one might do, but once you start with a map that has all the info in it, it's interesting to us to think, okay, why do, why do they make the certain adjustments that they make? Okay, here's Saudi. Saudi is, uh, is a denier, so this is another map. You notice the Google logo. Notice the name of every country, except Israel. It's otherwise the Google map. All the outlines are the same. Uh, it has, has dots, it has the destinations that, uh, that Saudi flies to. Now, a couple points that are a little interesting about Saudi. One is that Saudi is a member of SkyTeam. SkyTeam is the Delta, Air France, KLM, and then 20 or so other carrier alliance, one of the three major uh, alliances. The other major alliances are One World and Star. Uh, in the blue box here, we just note that uh, the other deniers are Kuwait, Middle East Airways, which is also a member of SkyTeam, a Lebanese airway, um, Fly Dubai, and Qatar, which is in the One World Alliance. So those are other um, deniers that use the Google map. Here, just for overkill, here's the Middle East Airways. Uh, same thing, it's a Google-based map that omits Israel. Now, the last category, this is sort of an interesting category. So, so does, what it, it lists Jordan, and does it list any boundaries, or it just lists... Well, it's got the same boundaries greater, as the regular... Greater Jordan. Jordan. It's a little bit I, hard I just to couldn't see. see it from Yeah, there. they're just, they're white on gray. So it's otherwise, this, it's the same uh, border. But there's no, it shows the borders? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. So like the regular Google map, the borders are all there, it's just a name that's missing. Name, okay. So, I mean, in some ways, I think the, the atlas that got in trouble uh, may have omitted the border as well and refer to uh, Greater Jordan. Okay. Now, Etihad and Emirates are very interesting uh, in, in the sense that they're, they're Middle East based, but they're very Western, uh, uh, Western facing. So for example, Etihad has as their spokesperson, Nicole Kidman. They do a lot of advertising, a lot of long haul flying. Um, they have a Google based map and Israel is missing from it, but as are um, a bunch of other countries. Okay, not, not it's not that they only put a country on it if they fly there, but it's also, so it's this sort of gray area in between. And then the other that's like that is Emirates. That's the Jennifer Aniston one with the very amusing commercials where she looks around the plane for a shower, can't find one, thinks what kind of airline is this? Um, another very outward facing uh, airline, they use a Google based map and they, they also, they omit Israel but a few others, or and a few others. It's a, they're kind of interesting omissions too, it's not, it's, it's, for example, it's not Taiwan, it's, it's certain countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that are kind of, if you had an early 19th century map, it would be the areas that Livingston hadn't gotten to yet. So it's, like, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, why it's kind of a random so group. Is, is there, can you pick out why uh, other countries might be omitted? No, we, no. I mean, none of the, when you think about the paper. Yeah, well, you think about the obvious, well, sort of the usual suspect countries, you know, uh, what, what are contested? Like North Korea, right? Mm -hmm. North Korea is missing from only one of these maps, or only two, I think, only the plausible deniers. Taiwan, is Taiwan ever missing, or just from one of them? But Taiwan's never missing from the Chinese carriers, you know, uh, nor is Cuba missing from the American carriers, so there's not a lot of purposeful missing. I th um, yeah, there's not, it's, there's not a, a widespread pattern of purposeful omission of countries. All right, so some preliminary observations, uh, uh, if it weren't already obvious, some major airlines omit Ezra, Israel from their online route maps. And uh, the deniers uh, that we've identified include three members of international alliances, two of them in Sky Team, one in One World, and the Google logo appears on a bunch of these maps. And so those strike us as, as kind of interesting facts. 
Now, the, the paper we're going to attach to those facts, <laughs> you, know, you could leave now if you wanted, those are the facts, but, um, but there is actually kind of an academic version of this that thinks about this discriminatory product differentiation. And so, just linking us back to the questions we started with, what explains map treatment? You know, and, and in particular, we're thinking about customer preferences and owner preferences. What explains the availability of kosher, you know, kosher meals? And again, the distinction between customer and owner preferences. And then, you know, a, a, a third question is to think about, well, do the alliances, you know, whom you might look to to discourage behavior like this, do they seem to care, or can they care? Do they have the ability to care, <coughs> given the choices they have among potential alliance partners, to care about this in whether they allow an airline into their alliance? So the way we went about studying this, beyond looking at a bunch of route maps, which was kind of fun, and taking all those screenshots, in case anything changes, we want to say, hey, we're not crazy, this is what it looked like when we looked. <laughs> So we looked, we, we found a, the, basically all the airlines on the planet and then restricted attention to those that, that fly internationally and, in, and serve the Middle East among other places so that their route maps would have the Middle East on them. And then we, we found all those that had an online route map and that's about all of them. So it's about 100, it's 114 airlines in total. Some variables are missing for some, uh, some observations are missing for some variables. But anyways, for all these airlines, or most of them, we have the map classification into one of these four categories. We know whether the airline's state-owned. We know how big the airline's fleet is. We know how safe the airline is, according to some third-party observer. We also know whether the airline is a member of uh, one of these three big alliances. For the countries that the airlines uh, are, are headquartered in, we know whether the country rec recognizes Israel. We know how anti-Semitic the country apparently is, according to the Anti-Defamation anti League's anti-Semitism survey, they have an index. We know whether it's an Islamic country, according to the CIA. Um, I mean, the CIA data, data book. It's not the CIA. <laughs> it's just a nice data source. We don't have any, any friends in the CIA that we're aware of. Um, then we have these airline-specific. So some of the kind of novel measures we have are these measures of the, both the, the potential anti-Semitism among the customers of an airline, as well as the interest in kosher meals among the customers of an airline in, in ways that are airline-specific. Now, if you think about those, those are kind of going to be hard things. It's not like a statistical abstract that has those in them. So we're going to either hope we're on the right line between clever and stupid in what we do here. To quote Spinal Tap. Uh, we, also, um, we also know something about the preference of the owners, right? So what we actually know is whether, and the way we're going to measure whether the owner uh, uh, is discriminatory is whether it's a state-owned airline in a country that does not recognize, or whose government does not recognize Israel. Okay, so how do we measure passenger anti-Semitism? Well, we use this very interesting data source called Google Trends. Google Trends is really pretty amazing. You know, whenever you don't have data, you can create data at Google Trends in the following way. Basically, what it tells you is what people are searching on by time and by space since 2004 and for every country, and, and actually within countries down to cities. And so, um, uh, what we what we so what we want to know is where are the customers for each airline. And so we use the names of the airlines. And Google, by the way, knows whether a word is in a category. So if you put in Emirates, it'll say, "Do you mean Emirates the airline?" We say, "Yes, Emirates the airline." And then it shows us the search intensities across all the countries of the world for Emirates. Now, uh, what we do then is we take those search intensities and we we use them to weight the anti-Semitism indices of the countries that, you know, uh, were the, so the, you know, the highest search intensity, um, well, we use the search intensities uh, in conjunction with data on either population or GDP to say what share of the either GDP or population uh, uh, passengers of this airline are from this country versus that, and then use those weights to apply to the ADL anti-Semitism indices to come up with uh, how anti-Semitic are the passengers on each other? So, so what is this ADL anti-Semitism? So the Anti-Defamation League does these the series of surveys uh, across the world to try to find out how anti-Semitic people of each country are. Okay, and so in fact, I'll show you a little bit of data. The uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scale of one to a hundred, and so uh, on the left we have the highest anti the most anti-Semitic countries. Report. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> So it's hard to be use anything but gallows humor in context like this. In any event, the so leaderboard we've got you know Iraq's at 92, Yemen is 88, Algeria is at 87, and so forth down to the UAE at 80. Here I've aggregated we've aggregated up to the continent. So uh, we've got Oceania, not very anti-Semitic. The Middle East, excluding Israel, pretty anti-Semitic. Uh, any of it. Um, and then just some some countries that may be of special interest to us. The U.S. is at nine, U.K. is at eight, Germany. Uh, 27, France at, at 37. Uh, okay, so 
Africa. Just um, some, yeah. Africa. Pardon me. So there weren't. So the we 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 did we didn't exclude Africa, but it's not. There's not much Africa in the in the survey. So I think it's getting included in the Middle East, but the rest of Africa is not in the survey, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Yeah, we didn't we didn't throw out any countries. <laughs> are you going to say a bit, Joel, about those are the results, but what are the constituent elements in the... Yeah. Oh, and, well, these are, this is just the AD, ADL measures themselves. No, but I mean, I mean, how does ADL? I think it's more oh, much how does yeah, I see. ADL do it? Yeah, so they ask a bunch of questions. Um, they ask a bunch of questions that are meant to, to gauge the extent of people's distaste for, uh, for Jews. Now, I don't remember offhand what those questions are. And then there's questions about the perceptions and then protections as well for things that are around religious freedom and that kind of thing as well. So think of anti-discrimination, public policy as well as around the perceptions of individuals culturally. That's, that's my understanding of the, of the index. You get both public regulatory and private, work, you know, private cultural views. So, I mean, and then by the way, when we... Uh, uh, just the Google data themselves you know, should validate those as well. So if you put in, uh, which we, and we did, you put in each of the names of the airlines, for example, if you put in uh, Aeroflot, you find out the search intensity is very high in Russia and Ukraine and, and much lower. And so it really, it makes sense. I mean, again, we wish we had literally data on who flies and what airline, we don't. But the Google data passed a smell test or a sniff test uh, as reasonable, because when you put in an airline that's in some part of the world, you tend to get high search intensities near where it's headquartered and where it flies a lot and lower search intensities elsewhere. So it strikes us as, a, as generating reasonable looking data. In fact, I think it's even, if you go a little further, it's, it's asking after potential passengers, because I think that that's actually, I think even a more, that's closer to the kind of, to think of construct validity of the measurement. You, you, you don't want to just ask who are the real passengers, the passenger list, you want to ask people who are also looking at this. So the presumption is that they're pinging on that site, they're potentially interested in those tickets uh, for all sorts of reasons, or not at all. That's a good point. That's a good point. So we do the same thing with the kosher interest. Here we do searches on the word kosher to see where is it around the world that people are interested or concerned about kosher, and then we match that up again with the airline search intensities to see to what extent are the passengers of Aeroflot interested in kosher versus the passengers of whatever other airline. And here's just a, a simple description of, of the results, at least the results on the question of MAP treatment and uh, anti-Semitism. So, we're going to put at the top the embracers. So number three is embracers, number two is avoiders, number one is deniers. Well, we've, we've collapsed the deniable, the, yeah. the two plausible deniable deniers into the deniers. Yeah, and we, we've done it both ways, but this makes it just very simple. There are these three groups. And now we're just going to ask the question, and then along this horizontal axis is this measure of passenger anti-Semitism associated with that airline. And the question is, as the measure of passenger anti-Semitism becomes higher, do, do airlines in general become more likely to be uh, uh, deniers? And the answer is yes. Or to put it the other way, the farther we are to the left of this thing, the less anti-Semitism there is among potential customers of the airline, the more likely the airline is to be a standard embracer. Okay. And we do the same kind of thing with kosher interest or kosher, kosher uh, the interest in kosher along the horizontal axis and a zero one one variable now for whether there's a kosher meal publicly advertised to be available uh, on this airline. And so just to be clear, what we're doing is that line in the middle is just, there are a bunch of ones and zeros, and we're taking the average, the moving average of those ones and zeros as we move from airlines uh, where passengers have very little interest in kosher to airlines where passengers have substantial interest. Actually, we cut out, That's we cut out, yeah, we, tr we cut out the, uh, the LL and the I mean, it, yeah. it, was, yeah. <laughs> it was way over to the right on the same scale. <laughs> well, we're not hiding anything. The point is that these two pictures show us that the demand-based measures matter. I mean, we'll see it again in slightly fancier ways, but uh, airlines whose potential passengers are, are uh, more anti-Semitic, um, those airlines are more likely to, uh, to deny Israel, less likely to embrace Israel on their maps, and airlines whose passengers have greater interest in, uh, in kosher, kosher meals, are more likely to offer kosher meals. So I remember when I read this, maybe I missed something, but I was, I was confused about what's the difference between, or is there one, between advertising the availability of kosher meals and simply saying we don't offer kosher meals? 
Well, so um, what we wanted to get at was whether the whether the well. So first of all, we were thinking that uh, the vegetarian meals probably kosher. So even if they don't say they have a kosher meal, maybe they do. And we had actually mistakenly thought the halal meal was kosher. Yeah, we've learned <laughs> since that's not true. But what we're it's we, not. Yeah, it turns out it's, it's compatible one way but not the other. We weren't that aware. But um, what we were interested in is not whether there's an ex-post option, but whether the airline is accommodating in the sense of publicly announcing the existence of this option at the website. So you know you could order it. Okay. So a very good chance. There is, uh, on a given airline, they may have a kosher meal. It's whether they advertise it online. Just like with the route map. There's a good chance in the seat back, it's a different kind of... But online, what are they saying? Because this is about conduct. You think of this as marketing. This is marketing. You know, once you're in the seat back, you're in the seat. They've got your money. Or they've, they've got it. It's, it's, it's now it's, who are they talking about? The customer demand? Are they setting this up in a way that would be attractive to certain individuals who want to make sure that you're not going to have those other folks there? Or is it just bigoted? I'm just, it's, I'm in, indulging my taste to describe. Actually, you know, before we get to stats, we should talk a little bit. There are two or three anecdotes about the airline industry. That are that are too too interesting not to share, and they're I think germane enough to justify five Dan, minutes. Dan, one of the reasons Dan is here, I'm sure he's a, he's a good guy, but he and I are doing some work on the airline industry oh. right now. So it's oh. so so yeah, issues. issues. So all all anecdotes are welcome. Okay, so so one is, and, and Paul, please chime in. I know you will keep the good stuff. I mean, so last year you may remember reading in the newspaper about Kuwait Airways uh, getting in trouble with the United States government. Now, why did they get in trouble? Kuwait Airways actually won't allow an Israeli passport holder on their plane, which works okay when you're flying to Kuwait, since what you wouldn't be able to get off the plane. But Kuwait Airways was, until recently, offering service between JFK and London. And uh, a couple, a young child, one of whom had an Israeli passport, had bought tickets, and one of them was denied entry on the plane. Now, again, on a flight between the U.S. and London, that turns out to be illegal. And so the Department of Trans after some pressure, the Department of Transportation said, you know, you can't do that. And Kuwait Airways said, okay, fine, we'll stop flying the route. They didn't say, we'll, we'll change our policy. We'll just stop flying the route. And the same thing happened a few months later on their Geneva-Frankfurt route. Okay, so just interesting things happening in this, in this industry with respect to this. Now, another one, totally unrelated, but... It, is it a state-owned airline? Yes. Yeah. That was state-owned. And also, you can't get off at the other, on the other side with the Israeli passport. Um, uh, under Camp David, uh, there's supposed to be regular air service between Israel and Egypt. And, and there it is. <laughs> uh, Egypt Air, among the, the carriers that do this, Egypt Air, which is a member of the Star Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, set up a subsidiary called Air Sinai. Air Sinai flies uh, an unmarked plane, one unmarked <laughs> plane. It's white. If you go to uh, Expedia to try to buy a ticket, you won't find Air Sinai, you know, we, we looked around a lot. We found an article in what seemed like a, you know, the Toronto Globe and Mail. It's a real newspaper. Yeah. And it had, no, it's a real paper. No, that was one of the examples of the real paper. We saw all kinds of crazy stuff. But okay, this is probably true. So they say, uh, if you want to buy a ticket, here's a number you have to call. You got to pay cash. You know, <laughs> and, and the plane, on uh, most days, it's this white plane. Occasionally, you know, that plane's out of service, and so it'll actually be an Egypt Air plane. But either way, once you get on the plane, it, it's Egypt Air, right? The Egypt Air flight attendants, Egypt Air colors of the you know, upholstery and everything on the plane. So there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of subterfuge about this issue. The last, and this is even less related, although it, it is about this broad, an anecdote about the broad question of, of product differentiation to appeal uh, to, uh, to, to different, in some sense, religious and cultural tastes. There's an Indonesian airline, I can't remember the name of it, Paul. It's, it's not Garuda, it's um... No, it's, no, it's a little one, it's a little startup. Uh, yeah, it's, It'll come it's to the us. religious one. Yeah, so anyways, this airline, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's like, it a second. It's, a, it's meant to be very kind of Sharia friendly. So these, the, the flight attendants wear headscarves, they don't serve alcohol, so it's just really meant to appeal mm -hmm. to a different, uh, a different uh, category of customers in Indonesia. Now, and interestingly, it's not actually owned by, uh, by Muslims, it's owned by Hindus. So it's just a market phenomenon of this product differentiation. I mean, and I, and I say that not to disparage anyone, it's just an example of product differentiation to appeal to certain kinds of tastes that are not unrelated to the tastes we're talking about here. Okay. And so, in a just as maybe a, a half a step backward, why, why would you care if Israel is not on a route map? So that's, so that's, a, that's a really good question. It came up when we talked about this at the law school. So let me, I'll, give, I'll give my answer, Paul, if you can give another. I think 
the reason to care, um, if you think about it, an airline that doesn't have Israel on its map probably isn't flying there. So there's some there's sort of a sense in which nobody's harmed. On the other hand, there's a sense in which denying the existence of Israel in an atlas or on a route map is complicity with uh, a set of worldviews that are, that are allowing lots of destructive behavior. So the, I think the, the argument for caring about this is an argument about whether reputable US-based corporations like Google and Delta want to be complicit in a denial that is arguably destructive, you mean outside of the direct relationships they have with their customers. So, so yeah. And I'd only add to that. So if, take that as significant. Is it substantial? And we have at least one anecdote and is the experience of HarperCollins. Why would they, upon being discovered, decide to pulp these maps, apologize, and move on? If this were, I think it was the, the equivalent of, I don't know, a, a hospital that is in a, uh, an old, it used to be a, a white neighborhood, and now it's a, a neighborhood with a minority groups, but the founders were all white. And you walk into the hospital, and, and there, there are the pictures of the, the white founders, and maybe you say, you know, come on, this is, it, it's incidental. It's just, maybe you don't like, but it's, it's insignificant and insubstantial. This seems to be substantial. And, and, and you might think of this from the standpoint, on the business school, on the business side, we talk a lot about how multinational corporations have this inherent problem where you have different cultural values, sometimes legal values. You have to find a way to reconcile those two where you have your home country values that are often very important, and so that's where you're incorporated, and that's where a lot of your constituencies are. But on the other hand, you're capital and your customers may be overseas and see this game of playing when in Rome do as the Romans do versus having one viewpoint almost inevitably puts you into conflict with somebody and I think this is capturing some of that and that's substantial we think that's substantial here that's why they would care about that. you guys might have noted that at the end I, 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 edit, I used a little editorial discretion and asked if you couldn't talk about the public if you thought there were any public Absolutely. policy implications of this and yeah, we do. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll try. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll give yeah. it a shot. Oh, it's Ryani Air, by the way. Ryani. That's it. That's right. yeah. Ryan. Yeah, no, it's just it's just interesting. Yeah. There's product differentiation along these dimensions. Imagine. Okay, so we, we also, if you remember back a few slides ago, this picture, sort of the, the statistical generalization of that is just to, to do an ordered probe it in this case with these three different outcomes: embrace, avoid, deny, and ask what is it that that seems to affect. So across the, the top row. Oh, Joe, just before you get in, yeah. one of the reasons why with the avoider, just because it, because it may say these are really just three different outcomes. Are not necessarily, as you say, they're not the, uh, to avoid is not necessarily uh, something which is a way station between right. the two. It could be, and I think this is Joel. Say a little something about oh, who right. are the avoiders. Right. The interesting. Well, it's not not just who are, but also if you look at what's correlated with the tendency to avoid yes. versus what's correlated with the tendency to embrace. Mm -hmm. The things correlated with the tendency to deny are also correlated in the same way with the tendency to avoid as opposed to embrace, which makes us think that these do belong on a spectrum. You know, that avoid really does seem to be, belong on a spectrum between deny and embrace, and therefore the idea of making them ordered outcomes that a statistical model can treat as being, you know, one is more so than the second, which is more so than the so third. So ordered probe. Exactly. So that's exactly what it is. It's an ordered probe analysis. But there's an interesting group. I mean, you think about it. It's mostly, it's a lot of Middle Eastern Arabs who have are avoiders, but then there are a couple of seemingly wild cards. And if you think about it, at least you have an explanation. One of the avoiders is, I think it's Qantas. You say, well, come on, this is not, a, Australia is not anti-Semitic. Think about where they fly. Think about the most popular routes, Sydney, London. Melbourne, London, where do they stop to refuel? So, so, and think about how you want to fill that plane, with what kind of customers, and this gets at this issue. So I think this is where, the avoiders is actually where I think there's really interesting variation in these ordered likelihoods. That's, we kind of, that's where you get the, the interesting variation for these models. Yeah, Sorry, no, that's a, that's a good one. I think Icelandic for some Icelandic. explicable reason I, also. Um, we're, I think we're going to find out there are a lot of charters that go to interesting parts of the world with Icelandic air. That's, I think, we'll find. So what you do see, one is just confirmation of what, that what you saw in the picture remains true regardless of what else you throw into the model. That is, the past year anti-Semitism uh, is negative and statistically significant regardless of what else we put in. We struggle a bit to try to find ways to measure the, uh, uh, kind of the measure of the preferences of the owner. I think the thing that makes the most sense for us is probably government owned and does not recognize Israel, which is the last italicized uh, variable there. I mean, we, we try to just let everything be in there. There's a lot of multipollinearity, but I think I walk away with the following interpretation of this, of this table, which is 
the customer preferences matter, and over and above the customer preferences, some measure of owner characteristics seems also to matter. That is, the government-owned air airlines that also do not recognize Israel are less likely to embrace after accounting for the preferences uh, of, their, of their customers. So just to, for a thing, on, that, on the last one, Joel, the, the, if you look at the, the regression output in the last one, so in, in column four, that really is an interaction. It's government, time, doesn't recognize. So, that's, so we have the two constituent individual variables, and then we have the, and we have the, the interaction. In, in column five, I think what that is, is we've now replaced that hierarchy with just a single vari variable, which is, there it is, a, a dummy that equals one only when it's government, um, yeah, I mean, and yeah, they don't recognize Because the other two are insignificant. Right, because the other two are right there. We didn't, so we we didn't just, omit very much. We don't have a lot of statistical power here, but the parsimonious uh, column five is consistent with the less parsimonious column four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's the kosher meal availability again, with a little bit more than just one variable at a time. The interest in kosher meal, the passenger interest, is what's on the first row, and it's always positive and significant. Uh, we also have then tried to see that this government owned and doesn't recognize plays a role, and it does seem to in the same way that it seemed to in the previous table. So after accounting for passenger uh, kosher interest, the uh, government owned and doesn't recognize seems to have uh, a negative and significant impact, whether we include the uh, other variables or not. So that, oh, let me just say, you know, what this, remember why we're doing the, the thing on uh, kosher meals and not just uh, Israel, is that this is about Jews and not just about uh, Israelis. So, I mean, one might take the view that uh, Israel is, is illegitimate and discriminated against, you know, as a matter of national policy, but even the countries that don't recognize Israel, their airlines tend to talk a lot about accommodating, being willing to accommodate Jews. Um, so that there's a distinction between uh, policy with respect to Israel and Jews. But the results here suggest a similar, sort of similar animating forces in the behavior toward Jews and Israel. So one thing about it, in both the, the this regression output and the previous one, you saw that we've entered also a variable which is a zero one. Are you a member of one of the three major alliances? And you don't want to ever make too much about insignificant results, right? That's, there are a lot of reasons why. Here, I think what's interesting, if you recall in the previous set of regression outputs, alliance membership never enters significantly. It has no bearing on where you are in that ordered probing. Here, at least in some of the specification, we see the first time we see it entering significantly positively. That is, other things being equal, you're a member of an alliance, you're, a little bit more, you're more likely to have that kosher meal. You don't want to hang your hat too much in that, because look at, at, at column five, where we partition this a little bit more. But I, I, I refer you to that because we're going to show you now, uh, show you something about alliance membership itself. So keep these things in mind as you think of the determinants of alliance membership. So yeah, nice segue. Um, so here we're trying to look at who's in the who's in an alliance. Okay, so which again, think about all your alliance, and they could either be in an alliance or not in an alliance. And so here we we stick in characteristics of the airline that we think might be relevant to whether an alliance would want you in the group. Are you safe? Are you government owned? How many aircraft do you have? Are you, uh, sorry, a big carrier? Are you an embracer of Israel? Uh, well, constant term is nothing in particular. And what's sort of interesting here, and what we do across this table, is we start out just using the full cross section. And then we think, well, maybe we can soak up some of the, some of the unobserved heterogeneity by having continent fixed effects, or region fixed effects, or country fixed effects, so that we're just identifying things off of you know, less variation. I mean, a lot of words there. The point is, none of that changes anything. So you might as well just go back to column one. And the interesting thing is that all that seems to matter for whether you end up in an alliance is whether you have a lot of aircraft. And I'll show you some raw data that I think will help uh, confirm that idea. I mean, think about it. if you want to, you know, what do you want from an alliance partner? You want it to serve a bunch of destinations you don't already serve. Right, you want yeah. feed. You want feed, <laughs> right, exactly. It's a network, they call it a network. You know, people use the word network so often. This one's actually a network. <laughs> And so if you look at these potential Middle East alliance partners, it's just a, a, some characteristics of all of the Middle East carriers in our data. So we have the fleet size, number of destinations, the safety rating, and then we have whether it's currently an alliance member and a headquarters country. It's treated on the route map, but the, the point is when you look at these, uh, most of the big carriers are already in an alliance. And Emirates and Etihad, they have a very different strategy. They're a global carrier with long haul flights out of the, out of the Gulf. So they're not really a natural alliance partner. An alliance partner for a Delta or a Sky Team or whatever would be somebody who, you know, who could get you to the little kind, the little cities of the of the region. 
So although they're big airlines that aren't in alliances, they're not really natural partners. Well, the other folks uh, who aren't currently you know, with dance partners are not that attractive as partners. So that leads us to remember, <laughs> to remember uh, this. Well, the slim pickings, for, if you're a certain age, you know who this yeah, guy is. But it seems like there's fairly slim pickings in potential alliance partners. That's slim pickings in Dr. Strangelove. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful movie for people of a certain age. All right. Actually, I think it's, it's instructive for people there. I agree with you. I mean, it's, everyone should watch movies in black and white. I mean, it's a wonderful movie. I watch it once a year. Okay. So let's talk, and then this will get us to public policy. And, and I, I think there are many limits. But let's talk about, if you view any of this stuff as a problem, let's talk about you know, a laundry list of possible remedies. So one possible remedy here is competition. So if this were an objectionable behavior, you could imagine competition uh, competing it away. It strikes us that's not terribly plausible. There aren't very many uh, possible carriers. I mean, there is a little bit of growth in low-cost carriers in Middle East countries, like Flight, no, not Flight but it's FlyNAS. There are a couple of low-cost carriers who've entered. There's been some deregulation. But still, uh, I, I don't, a lot of the, area, uh, the carriers we're talking about are really insulated from competitive pressure by being government-owned. So we don't think competition is, is going to make this go away, at least not quickly. A second thing you know, one might look to is pressure from alliance leaders. And although we didn't see alliances caring in some sense, there is, if you look at the, you know, the news stories and the record of Delta's involvement with Saudi and SkyTeam, there is at least some ambivalence. I don't know how you'd characterize it. There's at least ambivalence. So uh, Delta doesn't co-chair with Saudi. Uh, of course, other SkyTeam airlines do. If you try to buy a ticket to Riyadh on, on the Delta website, can you? But you can at the Sky Team. So there's a, it's a funny ambivalence that Delta has about its relationship with uh, Saudi and MEA, which leads us to think that there might be some, uh, some avenue for you know, operating through the leaders of the alliances to, to perhaps change behavior. Another one is suppliers, and in particular, the, the Google supplier. I have no idea, now Paul's a lawyer, he might, might phrase this differently. I have no idea whether there's anything illegal about altering the Google map. I sense I suspect there isn't anything. But a, a very different question is what's the, what's the wisdom on Google's part of not just letting people alter the map, but also leaving your brand logo on it? I mean, that, that's, that seems like a curious decision. I mean, I can understand saying, you know what, terms of service, do what you want. But leaving your, it's like writing a paper and saying, go ahead and change it and leave my name on it. Um, and with some co-authors, that'd be okay. <laughs> but, but, um, anyway, so, so that one strikes us as a potential interesting pressure point. Although not, not maybe as a legal matter, maybe more as something else. Another uh, possible remedy is, is changing in, changes in customer attitudes over time. I mean, certainly in the U.S., attitudes towards discrimination have changed a lot. And I think a lot of things that were commonplace are really considered odious by a wide swath of people now. So I think this can change things. I don't know, we don't know what direction attitudes are moving in in this context. So I don't know whether to look to that. And the last one is, uh, is government intervention. Now, you know, we, talk, we told the Kuwait Airways story. So that was different, right? That was denying access to the airplane, right? You can't get on if you have an Israeli passport. This is not that. Uh, so. It's not clear that map treatment is illegal. On the other hand, it's not clear that it's not. <laughs> That's the thing. So I think interesting things is uh, that we were just on the phone before we walked in here uh, with a law firm that had been involved in the Kuwait Airways incident in the U.S. and then in Switzerland. And one of the things that the attorneys have pointed out is Kuwait Airways had done this for years without any challenge from anyone. And they just run into this funny situation where they were offering extremely low price tickets mm -hmm. between New York and London, and this couple and this baby decided to take advantage of it. So, and, and of course that leads to the end of these connecting flights, and then, and then uh, both in, in between the U.S. and Europe, and then within Europe. So, so they thought it, it was better to stop the, this arguably profitable flight rather than uh, having uh, some of the Israeli passports. Yes. And, and I assume if it, if it was a cost-benefit decision, then you, would have, then you would have thought that they would lose a lot of customers uh, by allowing Israelis on... on you mean a, a standard commercial? Right. Yeah. That they would have lost a lot of customers 
because of allowing uh, someone with an Israeli passport on. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. So, but so I was they're, better, they're better off closing. Right, then, for their customer base. Yeah, and, or because or, the adult or, their taste. Or is well, the owner, is the owner yeah, preference? It's the owner taste. No, and, and, and what, you know, uh, just a, in another venue, for example, Walmart, if there's a union uh, organizes a Walmart, they'll close Better the store. Better to close the store yeah. than, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Although, it's kind of a, think of Walmart doing that as a matter of taste. And, and well, as opposed also to, probably as a yeah, signal. Maybe, more, maybe, maybe, right. maybe. I mean, it would be neat, the, the nice story would be, also, if my customers don't like to go to union stores, I mean, you might think of that. Or, or this is sending a signal if, if right. there's another to store that organizes that, that <laughs> you're, out of, you're out of a job. So, so what I, one of the things that I found interesting with this anecdote was how long this was going on. Mm -hmm. And so, and this one we would say is really about treating people differently, right? This is back to the, a little bit of the story about the Denny story, mm -hmm. one which is in an international context, and there is law. <clears throat> That, that we might think harder about uh, relating to the protection of especially flag carriers uh, that involves comedy versus uh, domestic law. So in this case, the FAA finally decided that this was illegal. They cited three sources of law for this, um, U.S. civil rights law, explicit civil rights law, uh, common law of civil rights. I was like, where does that come from? And then anti-boycott laws that were passed in the 1970s or recently updated under the Obama administration, anti-boycott as in as in deterring companies that are pressured by Arab states to boycott Israel as a condition of service for them that came about after the Yom Kippur War. Mm -hmm. so, so it's really interesting that this only comes about in this context after years of, you know, if you want to say, you know, colorable violations of it. Yeah. So now take it just a step further and say what we're asking about, why hasn't anybody, and this is what we were, we were asking law firms, has anybody ever kind of gone after either the airlines themselves that do this as a form of discriminatory marketing or whatever odious or repugnant marketing, um, or after the allied airway airlines in the U.S. or their or their um, joint venture entities, the, the the alliances for accommodating this or not supporting this, and and the answers that we are getting is, boy, I never thought about that. Right. I haven't seen that before. It's a, it's, we would probably say it's an attenuated step from the story you just heard about Kuwait, but it's in the same genus, if it's not the same species, potentially. I want to be clear about the facts here. Was the couple and the baby who were chucked off, was, you say that, you know, that, that the practice had gone on for a long time. Were there, were there any recorded instances of that particular sort of thing happening? Or was it just that it never had come up? We don't know. I mean, what we do know is that one of the, well, I don't remember whether the mother or the father had an Israeli passport. That was the only passport they had. And so I think it was the mother. She was denied. Right. And then the baby, by presumption, under Jewish law was. Well, right. look, no, 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 you're, you're, you're hitting the big stuff. No, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so, I guess, so we don't, we don't know. I don't, yeah. Well, I understood you guys to say that the, the stop in London was relatively recent. And traditionally, they just fly from New York to Kuwait. So I don't, I don't know. No, it sounds like it sounds like it was the opposite. It sounds like for some time, right. Kuwait Airways had this connector, right. uh, as they did with connecting flights within Europe, that oh. eventually terminated in Kuwait. But they oh. had these stops, oh. and, and so it's just because of that. So they, okay. they won in they won on the New York London route, and then and then found an Israeli passport holder was denied access to a flight between Geneva and Frankfurt. Did the same thing. Kuwait then ended all their European connecting flights as well. So, and one of the things we've been asking after is whether any of the denying airlines that are members of alliances have the same kind of connecting flights. Our understanding is, at least so far, is that they don't. So they don't have that exposure liability. And therefore, you know, the, their allied airline airways or their um, joint venture groups like Sky Team and like don't have that. But there are these other things which are colorful. So when I see three kinds of colorful relationships. If this, if you think of an airline like Delta, you think of a joint venture like Sky Team, and then you think of a supplier like Google, as Joel has rolled out, where, where the, you would ask after with regard to um, U.S. civil rights law, and so far as there's an activity going on that, at least a colorable claim, uh, involves activities in the U.S., marketing activities, you know, whenever a Saudi Arabian, Saudi plane flies into the U.S., there it is, and a potential passenger from the U.S. is pinging on that. Then also think about the Sky Team, which is a Dutch private company. There are Dutch laws, as there are in, as there were in Switzerland, against discriminatory treatment.
treatment of individuals based on national origin and other uh, activities, that marketing is not necessarily speech, it's conduct, it's corporate conduct. And so you could see those two. And then, and then with Google, it's a little different. You might think about trademark and copyright protections, and we have exceptions to those, at least in US law, and I, I imagine European law, for protections that are asserted in the context of either illegal or immoral conduct. So you can't put a Google trademark on some advertisement for some morally re reprehensible activity. You don't get protected underneath that. So those are interesting issues that I think, at least so far as we are, they are not explored. Perhaps because they're so attenuated, perhaps because so, they're new. So, so the, the story might be, if the Ku Klux Klan wanted to put a Google map. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's uh, a great example. So what would, what would Google do? So what it would be, when someone barely nothing <laughs> right it would be not so much what Google do is what Google no longer could do you'd say if if some you would you would hope that Google would say take that off from us but then if someone were to use the Google trademark in that uh, and they would say look we're protecting our trademark they say well not in this particular case in this instance because it's 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 supporting an either illegal or immoral activity so we don't we don't want people to be the so have they done this in other contexts like the one I just mentioned I, I don't know. I don't know. That might be a nice counterfactual. Yeah, I bet they haven't, but it would be good to know. Yeah, that's a great one for them. Yeah. But I think that was the interesting thing for us is you know we, is that this is not necessarily something which um, people in practice, professionals, especially legal professionals, have run into. One of the our part of our conversation also was that the lawyers had said that they had called the Department of Commerce, which which administers our anti boycott laws. They have a series of regulatory you know lists that you can look at. Uh, you can find out if you're an exporter whether you're going to be in trouble if you do these things. For example, you shouldn't uh, sign an agreement that has, even if it's just boilerplate language at the end that says, I'm doing business with X and X wants you to acknowledge that I'm from this country and our country doesn't recognize Israel. That would be, signing that would be a tolerable uh, uh, violation of the anti-boycott laws. You shouldn't do that. Okay, so when you call the Commerce Department to find out, you know, get guidance, there's nobody answering the phone. In fact, there are no staff. What the Commerce Department says, we don't have enough staff attorneys to help you with that. So you can imagine, it's like the, the phone, call, you know, phone that just keeps ringing. Leave a message, we'll never get back to you. So that, if you want to get your grade changed in my class. Exactly. <laughs> so, so that's an interesting, it, which tells you about, you know, the really importance about not just what's, what's stated in the books, but how prosecutory discretion works, how we allocate resources for these important public policy issues. And the answer right now is, Maybe none of this has happened because as a matter of public policy, we don't allocate any resources to it. It's not convenient. Yeah. It's pretty. And then as a matter of private, we say because individuals maybe haven't thought about how you might, you know, the novelty, the, the legal innovativeness. They say, gosh, it should have happened, but the Kuwait Airways challenge is a very recent challenge. And so maybe some of these other issues just haven't been explored. Yeah. Well, one thing Dan and I have discovered in looking at the, these alliances, because it's, it's the, some of these alliances are actually quasi-mergers, and the mergers are not possible because of national legislation right. about ownership, right? But this is going to get a much bigger look over the next few years because some of these very airlines that you guys are looking at have been uh, have been massively uh, engaged in massively uh, subsidized uh, behavior. Uh, in terms of, uh, in, in, for, for all kinds of reasons, having to do with the tastes and ambitions of the government. And it's, you know, it's, it's inviolate. If it were subject to WTO regulation, and it isn't because it's a carve-out, but it would be just, you know, these would be subsidized exports. So the extent, and I think along the lines you both studied before, the extent there's literature on alliances and vicarious liability for the, for the members of the alliances, right. so the extent we see that, it's largely in a discussion either in scholarly uh, pieces or in real cases in the context of antitrust issues. Right. Uh, it's not in the context we've described, right. and, and, and you kind of see why uh, for that. So, right. but but it, it doesn't mean that these it doesn't mean that the, those 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 uh, those potential issues, legal issues, aren't there. Right. For us, it's it's interesting just to document this set pattern right. and connect it. But there are policy issues that go with it. Does Israel care that they're left off these? Well, I, so I've talked to, I, I can't say for, for Israel, I can say for the 10 Israelis I've talked to. Eight of them here. Two of them like that. 
Tell me something I don't know. So it's, so it's, a, it's a random sample. <laughs> yeah, it's not a random sample. So, so they do things. They don't. They, I mean, does it does it sort of hurt? I mean, Israel in the international arena does it uh, result in an economic costs or? I mean, so one of my Israeli friends said to me, he said, let me make you a list. This is not high on the list. Okay. This is, you know, this is not, this, compared to other things that are irritating to me, this is not high on the list. Uh, so. are, are, are there other, aside from these three alliances, are there any other major alliances? Uh, well, there are lots and lots of sort of bilateral agreements outside, but there are only three major right. multi-airline right. alliances. Because okay. I was wondering about, I, I know that Air France is, is essentially tied in with Delta. Right. right. What about Lufthansa? They're in the... Uh, Star. They're in the other Star. one. They're in the other one. But, right. but, the, but, the, but, the, but what's tricky is that there are sub-alliances that are sometimes closer to mergers than, than the, you know, than the, the, the broader sure. group. So, so like so, KLM so, reference yeah, Delta. I mean, they actually share revenue yeah, on the right. transit so it's, a, so it's really a complex pattern. But I, uh, the reason I raise this issue is that I have a feeling the role of governments in airline uh, behavior is going to be subject to a lot more uh, scrutiny in for, for, for reasons this included, but for these other reasons too in coming years. Right. I, 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 for a lot of reasons. I, I think it's interesting. So we mentioned that there are deniers in two of the three major airline alliances. That is, there are two deniers in SkyTeam and one Qatar Air, Airways in One World. Well, so is Star Without Sin. You just need to go one step further. Look at, for instance, one of their key avoiders, Egypt Air, which serves largely the same area as, for instance, Saudi Air. And, and as Bob has pointed out, look at who they co-chair with. And if they co-chair with, it's it's the it's the usual suspects of the deniers. So it's a little bit like saying, I don't discriminate, nor does my 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 partner here, but my partner's friends. And in the case of Delta, it's in, in 2011, Delta brought on both. Middle East airs are announced, and then in 2012 actually brought them on, Middle East Air and Saudi Air. And as you might guess, um, individuals in the U.S. and other parts of the world, including Israel, said, gosh, this is going to be discriminatory. They don't even allow you to bring into Saudi Air. You can't bring in uh, religious um, appurtenances. You can't bring in a crucifix. You can't bring a Star David. You can't bring things. You, 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 you've, you, you've taken trips. You know a little bit about those issues. And the answer was at Delta, no, at Delta, we don't discriminate. That was the answer from Delta. It was not, it was carefully worded, it's not Saudi doesn't discriminate. We just said, Delta we don't discriminate, and every sovereign country has the right to set their own rules about who can enter and how they can enter. And by the way, we don't co-share with them. But these are potentially, maybe we don't, misleading. Because of course, Saudi does co-share with other Sky Team members. It's a condition of membership in Sky Team. You have to do three things. You've got to co-chair, you've got to open up your lounges, and you have to share your frequent flyer miles. Mm -hmm. And and they do that with Sky Team members. They do those things directly in two of the three with Delta. They do the last one with Delta through Air France, right? So you kind of think of Air France as the middleman between this. So they do these things, and, and, and they do them directly with the joint venture. And, and if you think of, we don't know because Sky Team is a privately held entity, but we suspect very strongly the largest shareholder in that, in a governance, would be Delta. And therefore, think in terms of the kind of vicarious liability of, a, of an entity which they control, or at least have a substantial say in, which accommodates, permits, requires this activity, requires airlines to support each other, even though the, the, the type of marketing engagement is repugnant, maybe illegal. That's, I guess, the thing. That's a big issue. So one wrap-up slide and one complimentary comment, which is just to say, even if there's no legal cause of action, it does strike me that the court of public opinion is one in which some of these things could be interesting. I mean, I think I would think that Google would be embarrassed uh, for people to be mentioning this, but who knows? Anyways, what do we actually just to wrap up? You know, we identify in this paper a form of product differentiation that's at least either employed for, uh, for discriminatory purposes or to, to discriminatory effect. I'm not quite sure what's the right way to phrase that. Numerous airlines, including these members of major alliances, deny Israel's existence on their map, and the Google logo appears on those maps. Um, this map treatment, when you look at what explains it, it seems to accommodate both customer and seller attitudes. 
and it, it affects both the availability of the kosher meals and the match. So that suggests it's not just about anti-Zionism, it's about anti-Semitism as well. Thanks. Well, that's good. Thank you. Minutes for additional additional questions about this. Obviously, there were a lot of questions while we while we were along. Everybody, come vote. That's right. <laughs> Make sure you vote. Yeah. Make sure you. Well, vote. if there aren't any more questions, we'll thank our guests and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Thanks. Again.